Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives from the world's leading global brands. Uh, today we have a special guest on the show. We're joined by Andrew Kakabedi, who's a best-selling author and professor of governance and leadership at Henley Business School. Uh, welcome to the show, Andrew. How are you? Thank you very much. Um, very good. Thank you. Hope everybody else is as well. Fantastic. Uh, before we jump in, uh, Andrew, tell everyone a bit about yourself personally and your, your journey to where we are today. It's been um, a one of twisted turns. I actually started in environment. I then went into mental health. I was uh, one of the mental health officers in Liverpool for children. I was in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Uh, then I went into public administration. Then I went into consulting, uh, helping a fish canning factory in Venezuela. Then I worked with government. And then finally, I became an academic at Cranfield University School of Management, which I was for a long time, and now at Henley Business School. So I've gone through about three or four career changes. So tell me more about the work you're doing now, and also what inspired this latest collaboration on this new book, obviously, which is we're going to be talking about today, The Leadership, leadership Intelligence, The Five Cues for uh, Thriving as a Leader. What was the inspiration behind that, and how did that collaboration happen? Years ago, um, I was involved in having to try and get rid of a board. And what was interesting, this was a major UK company, one of, one of the biggest companies in the UK. And what was interesting were the problems of the company that led to its ultimate demise. The board knew and the top management knew. In fact, about 60 top managers were not only knowing of the problems and what to do about them, but they were predicting the week of its demise 65 months into the future. And in fact, there was a little bet going on privately and one guy won the web. He actually said the week. But what was interesting about the other 59 or so was that there were only about four or five weeks out of the side of that week. So I noticed there was an oddity which I could not find in the classroom, and that is coming up with a rational view on strategy, a clear view on your role, knowing the difference between the role of the chairman and the CEO, what is the HR director supposed to do, did not help. But what was the reality was the situation or the context. What was happening in that situation that basically had bright, intelligent, talented, well-experienced, uh, powerfully educated people behave in a way that was almost a paralysis. They couldn't move. And then I noticed that that was commonplace. So I undertook uh, a survey, a whole series of surveys now, 15 or so, my wife and I, and we now have a database well into the 20,000 organizations, five and a half thousand boards, three whole governments in the survey. Uh, and what did we find? Everybody knows. So number one, insight is there to an unbelievable degree, accurately, when you're in trouble. Secondly, the steps to take are intimately known. The problem is taking them. So the book was really a counter to some of the rationalist thinking that came out of the United States, particularly from 1890, the Chicago School of Econ Econometrics. And that influenced virtually every business school, Cranfield and Henley included. And that is, get the strategy right. Well, if you get the strategy right, we get the structures in place. And if we get those in place, then we deal with the people. What was I finding? It doesn't matter if you get the strategy or structures right. If you're not dealing with the people, you've got nothing. So the book is a complete reverse of thinking of basically the last 120 years. Wow. Yeah. And I, I try to say it all the time to my friends, so you have the best strategy in the world, but if you're not executing on it and you don't have the people and the culture, it doesn't matter. Chris, what you've just said may mean eminently, may be eminently sensible for you, but believe it or not, from our statistics, you are less than 18% of the world's companies. And only could we find 18% or less had a best practice. And the best practice is you take account of context first, which means you take account of the people in that context. You take account of the reality of the culture as it is. And then you start a process of engagement so that people can really identify with what's happening, as opposed to getting bits into place, like a jigsaw puzzle, get everything aligned. And that is, in a sense, the book, it challenges the concept of just get alignment and then everything is okay. It basically says, if you haven't got engagement, you've got nothing. 
and that and that's where HR's role, right? So, w w where can HR, how and where can HR have impact in this? What would your it's advice very, be to HR leaders? It's a very very good question. We did a separate survey with HR directors and the HR function, and the theoretical answer is HR should be sitting next to the chairman. It should be the function that fundamentally advises on how the whole future of the enterprise and the way it's operating should be. What we have instead is the finance director, and the finance director sits next to the CEO, and by nature, because it, most of them are also board members, sit next to the, uh, to the chairman, but not the HR director. So we wanted to know why, and we found that over the years, HR has been losing its influence in the corporate hierarchy, regretfully. It has gone too much into processes, systems, ways of doing things, which are absolutely right, by the way, uh, clearly established roles, uh, prescriptions for how you go about an interview process, all those are necessary. But then that added value bit, that clever bit, which is about how we massage the culture so that we can move forward and have a level of service that's uh, equal to none and have the board behind it and understand it. It's that bit, it's that political bit that the HR director has been losing out on. I would have said 25 years ago, the HR director was more influential than now. It's regretful. What I'm also picking up is that many HR functions no longer have an HR director. They're reporting to the board or the top team through finance. And that's a slow, increasing, creeping uh, development. And I do not see that in a positive light. Everything that we've said, the, the reality of engagement and why it's so important is now falling into second place. And yet, if you look at all the corporate collapses from Marconi, Enron, 30, 40 years ago, to the ones that happened last year, do you know what was the feature of all of them? Six months before their collapse was announced to the press, they were the epitome of world-class governance, which meant world-class compliance. They were following all the rules. The reality of what they were doing was something else. So to the outside world, there is this fantastic company, and nobody can believe it's gone bankrupt. But to the people inside, they knew the ails of the organization five and a bit years before. And the HR input was somewhere, and it was not at the table. It was somewhere else. I'm sure everyone's thinking the same question as me, but if people know, why are they doing nothing about it? The paralysis is an interesting one. It's, it's uh, emotional. And it's a psychology. So if you look at the whole sociology of a big system and you plan it, one of the key uh, areas that you may omit in your thinking is the psychology of how certain interactions take place. Now, I'm sure you, as I, as everybody else, will have found themselves in a situation where they are very uncomfortable. They know the discussion is going the wrong way. They know it will be a real challenge to raise the uncomfortable issue. They know that even their futures may be at stake. But the real challenge is feeling uncomfortable at that meeting. So how do you challenge the CEO? When that person is convinced it's going to go one way, the country is going to go one way. And in fact, you can see that that way is full of challenges and hurdles. So what do you do? So the reality that we detected is that when those emotions of discomfort really take a hold on you, they take a hold on you greater than your rational thinking. And there must be many people who are superb at handling all sorts of problems in one part of their life, walk into this meeting, and in this part of their life, at this meeting, at this moment in time, they dare not raise that uncomfortable issue. And they know what is going to be the outcome. They can almost tell you before the meeting is over how it's going to finish, what's going to happen in the corridors, what are people going to gossip about, What's the CEO going to moan about? It's unbelievable the insights that those individuals have short and long term. But handling the dynamics of misalignment is one of the critical skills that in a sense has been neglected for quite a while. And the reason is because of the word politics. You have to be political to be able to handle those uncomfortable dynamics. And in many ways, politics was an unwelcome form of thinking, a black art, if you like. What we're finding is that politics is one of the five critical skills for any top director, be the HR, finance, or whatever.
that's a direct reflection on the culture that like businesses created, right? The culture where you can't speak up, that you will be reprimanded. And I've worked in businesses like that before, and it's 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 horrible. <laughs> and 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 I have been in meetings. I was actually thinking of a specific meeting where, uh, in a previous uh, a role where I was sitting there going, "I know this is going to fail, but who am I to interrupt the CEO? Who am I to say this? What are they going to think of me?" You know. So I've been there, and I'm sure many people listening right now, the vast majority of us have been in those meetings and those situations before. Uh, Absolutely. And those feelings of discomfort, be it how I'm perceived, will my job be there? Will I have a future? Will I be able to even sound reasonable when I'm feeling so comfortable and and I can't get my words out right? So I'm even not going to express myself very well. These are common uh, experiences. In fact, what we found in our survey, and the survey, as I said, is 19,500 organizations, 67% of the top team members dare not raise the uncomfortable issue. When 100% of them know what the problem is and what to do about it, 67% dare not raise it. Fundamentally, less than about a third of the world's top teams only have the courage to raise the uncomfortable issue, and two thirds will just go with the drift that's already in place. And these are directors. This is not somebody who's in a middle management role. Sure. This is somebody who could be the marketing director. Is this, a, is this a CEO problem or is this a wider problem than that? What, what, what is the, the main? It's a, it's a wider problem than that. It may be down to the CEO. It may be down to legacy and unfortunate negative culture. It could be many things. But the real bigger problem is learning engagement when there's tension, is learning to find pathways through problems that are both intellectually challenging but also emotionally challenging. It's when life is not straightforward and distinctly uncomfortable, that is when your leadership needs to be shown. And that is the time when leadership is not. So if you're going to just pick up a book on a military leader or political leader, and it's been written favorably, um, you will find that how they handle big problems. Where do you find the book that says at this meeting, they let something go and a disaster occurred? It is those meetings when there are such discomforts, that's when the leadership needs to shine through. And it's not an aggressive leadership. It's actually a clever, well thought through, rational leadership, but very conscious of these sensitivities and interactions at that meeting. And funnily enough, uh, certain people, when there is big drama, let's say Winston Churchill, if we go back in history, was superb at that. But when there wasn't big drama and you had to engage and you still had to engage at the end and you couldn't have enemies, he was hopeless at that. So engagement is now just beginning to shine through as a major executive leader, a lever rather, and that's not been trained for. Yeah. So tell everyone about the five cues. Let's start from number one and go through. The five cues were really an attempt to see how successful executives even government ministers, private sector, public sector, uh, senior people were operating. And we noticed there was a hell of a sort of higgledy-piggledy pattern. That the way they operated didn't sort of seem to make sense until we cottoned on to one thing, and that was somehow or other this individual in this situation knew about how to handle in this situation, handle themselves in this situation. They walk out of the door to another board meeting and they handle themselves differently. And once we noticed that these individuals were so contextually oriented, how do I get this message through here? I may do it a different, differently somewhere else. Then we began to seriously observe. And then we noticed there were seemed to be five patterns. The first pattern was funnily enough, IQ. Are you smart enough for the job? Are you smart enough to put forward that compelling argument? Are you able to draw on distinct strands of data and input and opinion, but put them together in such a unique way, somehow or other, what you're saying makes sense to everybody else? Now here, the IQ does not refer to IQ tests or any sort of formal examination. It's a sort of living way of operating and justifying yourself, especially when you're under pressure. I remember seeing a 15-year-old boy, he was selling tomatoes. And somehow or other, he seemed to make more money than everybody else. 
So I just stopped when I was walk, walk, walking to work and spoke to the guy. And I said, why do you seem to be making quite a bit of money? Because I could see also he was trying to buy a car, which he shouldn't have been, and it was a fairly snappy car. He said, well, you know, what I noticed, I'm not selling tomatoes to people. I'm selling tomatoes to women. And he noticed that the point where women would talk to him was at a junction, was exactly at a corner, especially near a zebra crossing. So he somehow was watching the flow of women going to work, the flow of men, women going to the shop and coming back home. And they needed something at that point in time. And he just made himself available. So he said, I first of all see where women go, and then I smile. And that's it. <laughs> but here was a business brain. And by the way, this 15-year-old um, is now a multimillionaire and is in the House of Lords. Really? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure you'd like to be reminded of that story, but that's how he started. The sensitivity to people is equally vital. Uh, we know that as EQ. Um, you getting into my feelings, my getting into your feelings, and somehow a symbiosis and understanding between us takes place. And then we noticed HR director, senior manager, it doesn't work. EQ has its limits. And we noticed the lives of people there, they described as political. So then a third Q emerged, PQ, the political quotient. And when we noticed people who were really good at handling complex relationships, they weren't manipulative, they weren't unpleasant. Uh, in many ways, they weren't even described as political by other people, but they understood the politics of interactions, which is a very different concept. So what PQ is, it's really EQ with an agenda. Getting to know you and working together as a team player on, on a football field is fine. But when you're the chairman of the football club, you still need the same sensitivities. You're dealing with people who've got mass funding that could damage your club at any time. But then you also need to know what you're doing at that meeting. What is the agenda that you're trying to get people around? And that's the skill. Then we notice one other factor, just the wear and tear of being a senior executive. Uh, and we came up with the fourth Q, RQ. What's resilience? Why do you need to be, if you like, sturdy, robust? Do you need to have a sort of strength and inner strength in you to see through all the pressures of the day and almost make those pressures, if you like, um, an ordinary experience. For somebody else, it's terrible. For you, it's just a normal day in the office. And what we found RQ to be, uh, it was partly, if you like, chemical in you, the level of uh, hydrocortisone you have your, in, in your stress uh, hormone, but principally, it was being realistic. We found those executives that had a high level of resilience had really thought through their circumstances. They had received feedback, at times the most unwelcome feedback, but they had a very good grasp on reality. And we found those individuals that really do have a good grasp on reality then have an equal grasp on how to work through that reality. And through that insight, a resilience emerges almost as a necessity. If you want to handle this problem, Sunshine, basically, this is the level of energy and commitment and drive that you need to display. Resilience. Yeah. Did you find that their past experience also influenced that? Massively. We had people telling us, often from a small childhood or often at school, and possibly with the teacher who guided them through certain difficulties, how they learned resilience. It could have been in the classroom, it could have been through facing lack of confidence, it could have been on the sports field, it could have been in some sort of social setting. But they remembered those times when their resilience was challenged and how they stood up to that and then found ways through. For a long time, I thought it was four cues. And what I was beginning to perceive in terms of the ethics and morals of the company was a great deal, a great many statements, often formally written down in some sort of company report, but not really practiced. And then I did some work with general managers. So these are the people just below the top team. So they could be the country head of somewhere, even the regional head in a small region, but they were not sitting at the top team and they were not directly interacting with the board. And they had ethical concerns. The reason was they had to achieve their sales targets. 
But how do you achieve your sales targets in a country where 96% of all transactions are based on bribery? Mm. So what do you do? Uh, do you not bribe? And that means 5,000 people get made redundant. Do you not bribe and almost hand the, the, that market over to a French or American or German competitor? For what? So it was the general managers that said, look, the moral issue is really very important. It's just because the top team and the board do not directly have to face it. That's why they don't take account of it. But I do. I am responsible for myself, my kids, my wife, my husband, uh, whatever it happened to be, and five, six, ten thousand 10,000 people. What do I do at the end of the day? Do I have my kids not go to private school, not have full health insurance, just because I'm feeling uncomfortable? So we explored it a bit more. And actually, your moral standing is vital. And what we find is people's moral standing varies quite a bit, but there is a line by, uh, from which they will not go beyond. What was, in a sense, depressing is when we did the surveys, is the three Qs that stood out, IQ, I understand, make the compelling argument, PQ, find a pathway through complex relationships, and RQ, have the strength of character to see all this through. The lowest Q at board and top team level was NQ, the moral quotient. And the reason was, it was convenient to talk about it, but say nothing. Yeah. And 18% of the world's companies actually placed MQ into the fabric of their operations. So we be it an American company, John Lewis Partnership or whoever, they had a culture that was so focused on performance, so focused on quality, so focused on people care, they would gladly give up income rather than have that culture, if you like, compromised. In fact, in one massive American company, it's got about 400,000 people. The shareholders were pushing them to enter into one of the big Eastern markets, and they were saying, do it or we'll vote the board off. And that's it, we'll get somebody else in. The board and the top team and the management, even down to the level of supervisors in Ohio, got together and said, what do we do with this? And the board and top team said, let's have a referendum. And they did have a referendum of about 10,000 people, representatives across the company. And the referendum was, A, we go into this market, your jobs are guaranteed, you'll get a bonus. B, we don't go into this market, some people may be made redundant. Do you know it was 97% B? And in Ohio, 97% B means you'll never work again. The employment possibilities are so bad. Wow. So here we noticed there was a culture that was so deep and it was around respect and they lived respect. When they went back to the shareholders, the board top team and half the general managers offered to resign on the spot and actually uh, ruined the company completely. So the shareholders panicked and said, no, we want you to stay. <laughs> and this is yeah. one of the most unspoken but moral companies in the world. You don't see their morality. You just see their very high quality level of performance. And you'll never hear redundancies from this company. They don't make people redundant. They look after them from beginning to end. Whatever it is, the people and the customers and the stakeholders are number one. Wow. Uh, before we wrap up, what would be your sort of, if there's one sort of parting piece of advice for everyone listening, what would that be? And then also, where's the best place that our listeners and everyone else can check out more about your work and, and, and get in touch? Uh, the website is the best place. Um, usually, most of our publications are there. So very gladly welcome so your website just for everyone. The website's uh, your you know kakabadzi dot com. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's what's the best thing at the moment? We really do need a very very sharp conversation, and it has to be at the top, regretfully, on the competitive advantage of this entity. If ever there is a time to no longer, in a sense, fool yourself about what is this company really worth and become very realistic about your competitive advantage. And for many organizations, their competitive advantage is costs. The more cost you take out, the more competitive you become. Let's at least be honest about that. Let's at least work on that and differentiate ourselves and really add value. And the same sort of thinking you'll apply to a charity or to a government department. There, you don't use competitive advantage and profit, but you do use the term value. How are we going to get more value out of this company, this entity, these assets than we have before? Once you start that conversation and then you extend it to the rest of staff and workforce, even on a limited scale, 
believe you, me, you have trust. And why would people trust you? Because they can trust that you're dealing with real evidence, with the reality of those circumstances, and they know that you have a sharp grasp of how, of what to do, how to do it, and what the pitfalls are. Now people can trust you. Mm -hmm. The question is, are our leaders sufficiently resilient for such open conversations? That's our problem. Well, well, thank you so much. Great way to wrap it up, Andrew. I appreciate us. I feel like we need another hour <laughs> to, go, to go over this issue, but I really appreciate you taking the time out to to join us. And um, you know, for everyone listening, make sure you you know head over to Andrew's website, grab a copy of the book, and there's so much other resources and other books on there um, that you're working on as well. Also, connect with Andrew over on LinkedIn and uh, follow follow him there. Um, uh, Andrew, it's a pleasure as always, and uh, I wish you and yours all the best uh, as we come through this and. Um, I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Okay. Chris, thank you very much. I much enjoyed the conversation. Uh, thank you for the questions. And likewise, yourself, your team, your family. I wish you all the best.